Thank you. Thanks for the floor. Thanks for the invitation to speak at this exciting event on the Nordics. Uh, and thanks for having it in Denmark. After all, uh, in the last decade, it has become increasingly common to see Denmark as no longer Nordic due to first our harsh debates on immigrants and then our somewhat muscular foreign policy. So I'm, I'm pleased not only to, to join you here, but also in that sense to rejoin Norden. Uh, and I think actually correctly in the sense that we in Denmark are Nordic, just differently Nordic. The theme of this conference and of the first session here is timely. What role does culture play in international cooperation, war and peace? Timely, but also potentially misleading, especially the Nordic case is one that you easily get wrong, leading to Nordic lessons that actually could be very problematic. So I've given the title of my talk, Culture, Identity and Peace, Nordic Experiences, and I'll try to complicate things a bit in relation to some preconceived uh, understandings. It's very easy to think that because the Nordic nations are culturally alike, with shared culture, a Nordic identity, some institutional infrastructure, we have been at peace for centuries. What would be the lesson in relation to other cases? Well, that would easily be rather defeatist or imperialist. Either you can only have peace among people who are really families, too bad for the rest, uh, or it can be make them like us or try to homogenize cultures. That would not be a very productive conclusion. And the problem is this understanding actually ties in with what in a sense is the standard image of culture and identity in the way we talk about international issues. The way we, the media reports, for instance, about conflicts, labeling them ethnic conflicts or religious conflicts, often give the impression that it's because there are ethnic differences or because there are religious differences that we have conflicts. So in a sense, the standard view tells you it is because some people are close share culture and identity that they can cooperate, and it's because some are too different that they go to war. We shouldn't really be able to think like that anymore, especially after the Balkan Wars in the 90s. It should really be quite clear that often wars become particularly ferocious when identities are blurred, when people need to make use ultimate means to clarify who they are and to make sure that Croats can be different from Serbs, even when language and culture seems at first very alike, and you actually have very intermingled stories. We get closer to Freud's narcissism of small differences than to a logic of difference as such being the re reason. And we see it clearly these days in the Middle East that religious struggles are often more bitter when they are sectarian rather than between different religions. And world politics is full of cases of cooperation among the culturally separate and conflict among those who share culture. So I think it's important to avoid the easy reading of the Nordic case, which is actually the wrong one. And I'll try to do that in three brief steps. First, telling something about the formation of the whole Nordic community. Then looking at the Baltic Sea region. And thirdly, Nordic cultures of global peace and security. If we look at the history of Norden, it's often taken as a te textbook case of a community of countries at peace. We really can't imagine war amongst ourselves. And strangely yet, this wasn't really researched much until recently because it seems so self-evident that no one would really try to understand why it came about. Since we can't imagine war, then why ask why it's not there? And actually, if you look at the history, it is a bit surprising because through the last five centuries, we have had some 50 international civil wars in the Nordic area, and the frequency of wars in the region, wars in the region only declined in the 19th century. It is clear that there is something special about the region, especially what my former boss, uh, the late Hokan Wieberg, called a series of non-wars in the region, cases where you would usually go to war because it was over territory, succession, and so on. Uh, the Norwegian succession from Sweden in 1905, Orland Island, Svalbard, Icelandic independence, uh, the Greenland question between Norway and Denmark, questions that could have led to wars and didn't. So there is something special. But if we go back, it's not because of shared identities that we did this. If you look at the history of the shared identities, they really came about in the mid-19th century as a pan-Scandinavian together with the pan-Germanism, pan-Slavianism, and there was no, as we could see from the other cases, guarantee that that would be peaceful. 
It was rather chronologically the other way around, that the fact that we ended up being an area of peace that fostered identity and shared culture rather than the other way around. And if you look at the reason for these non-wars, then it had a lot of historical coincidence. Hogan Weber again argued very convincingly in one of the best analyses of this, that it was historical coincidence with Fortuna in the case materialized in the figure of Tsar Alexander I, because after the Napoleonic Wars and the Vienna Congress, Finland was transferred from Sweden, from Sweden to Russia and Norway from Denmark to Sweden, which meant that they obtained more autonomy than they had had before. And when they eventually had to succeed, they did it from recent motherlands, not from the old motherlands. Much more easy to accept, much more easy to depart. So it was a kind of historical coincidence that meant that the obvious wars didn't happen and we got into a culture of uh, not having wars. So it's not a sequence of culture leads to identity, leads to peace. It's rather the other way around. Peace leads to identity, leads to culture. Second story, Baltic Sea region after the Cold War. At the time, it was often claimed that now after the Cold War, a natural whole would come back together after decades of separation. Historical examples like the Hanseatic League were paraded and the Baltic Sea region was presented as destined to grow together. That was not really compelling. The cultural similarity between a Dane and a Lithuanian is not really greater than that between a Dane and Italian, says even I, whose father was born in Kaunas, Lithuania. Uh, no, it's not really true that the region was a natural unit, but we could make it one. And this is actually the more interesting story. And this is really autobiography in the sense that from around 1990, I was involved as a researcher and doing commission analysis for the Nordic Council, together with Patsy Joinimi on this. And we developed a model of region building saying, there's really no room for new political institutions. Between a growing EU and a resurfacing nations, there's no room for a Baltic structure of a lot of organizational uh, activity. The regional level had to be self-propelling network activities done by schools, corporations, Girl Scouts, everyone just picking partners in the regions voluntarily. So therefore, the sequence had to be first culture, secondly networks of interaction, and third economics. The culture, including the writing of history, had to produce the map to define the distances, as we just talked about, creating those very proximities that are not given in advance. Then form the self-evidence which would make a theater group pick a partner from the Baltic region instead of from somewhere else. And it was characteristic of the time after the end of the Cold War that we had lost the previous maps, so we had to produce new maps. And those maps were then reaching back to history, down to geography, into culture, saying we have to have a basis for politics. But really, it was politics to do that. It was a politics of creating those identities which you would then base politics on. That was a very deliberate project, so to say, to go the route of culture produces identity, produces cooperation, in order then to reap economic, practical, and cultural benefits, possibly peace as well. Did it succeed then? We'll get back to discussing that during these days. Partly, the region is today seen as real, but the whole process with Baltic and Polish membership of EU and NATO overtook the Baltic Sea regions to some extent. So today, yes, we have close relations, Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Sweden, Poland, Lithuania, some German economic presence, but not much of above average. Uh, Danes don't have particularly very tight relations to the Baltic region. Maybe that will change now when we allegedly have to defend them against Russia, according to our politicians. More could be said about that, but I'll have to continue to the third point uh, about Nordic cultures of global peace and security. What about Nordic experiences in using culture and identity to gain security, to produce or promote peace internationally, globally? Well, in the last 75 to 100 years, Nordic cooperation amongst ourselves was not the way to solve our main security problem because it was not in the Nordic region that we found our main enemies or our main allies. So what roles did culture, identity, and Nordism play in security for the region? Well, during the Cold War, the Nordics formed a strange subsystem where we were almost on different sides in the Cold War, technically, and still we had a kind of collusion 
against our respective big brothers of keeping them somewhat at distance. In the academic literature, that was called the Nordic balance, but it was really a balance of restraint in the sense that if we could keep the US out of its allies, uh, Norway and Denmark, and not having bases and nuclear weapons, keeping the Soviet Union to only have a soft hand on Finland and have a, a relatively strong Sweden in the middle, there was a way of being part of the Cold War and yet having it somewhat at a distance. The result was a region of low tension, a milder version of the Cold War, which became a crucial part of the whole identity of the Nordics during the Cold War, tying in with the third way, third world engagement development age. So the whole most glorious Nordic global identity emerged under these conditions. So cultural proximity here enabled this kind of informal orchestration against all odds, and we had a kind of culturally to security least to identity. That was all called into question with the end of the Cold War. I wrote an article in 92 published in Chatham House Journal of International Affairs called Nordic Nostalgia, arguing that the Nordic countries actually had a more different, difficult time than most others of coming to terms with the end of the Cold War because we had had a privileged position in the Cold War structure by being better than others at dealing with the Cold War. So it was a little hard for us to get used to living without the Cold War. But eventually we found new roles. The Nordic countries took different lines in relation to war and conflict resolution, but we all are very strongly internationally committed. We all spend more resources proportionally than most others on international affairs, and we all include culture in our strategies. Especially in the case of Denmark, this is tied into strategies for promoting democracy, rule of law, strong civil societies, things that I think Jakob Skolko will say more about. The other Nordics do this too, but they have less focus on a specific Western uh, content and more on the processes of mutual accommodation. Is this a good strategy today? Well, this depends on your reading of the general role of culture and identity in global politics in the period we are entering. And here, I'll submit the idea that the nature of conflict related to culture and identity is changing. Consequencing, the potential of culture for preventing conflict changes too. That is, of course, a very big claim and is something that would demand a whole election itself, but we might get back to this in the discussion. So let me try to condensate the argument. During the first quarter of the century after the Cold War, the so-called post-Cold War period, which is now ending, the period of Western hegemony and US unipolarity, their culture and identity were powerful cards to play in defense against homogenizing globalization, against the center. You could make arguments, not really culture against culture, not this culture against that culture, but culture against the non-culture of the globalizing uh, capitalist uh, uh, hegemonic system. So it was not so much the differences but the question, a general anxiety, would there be room for culture at all? In the emerging post-Western world, where we have not one center, but many centers, and more equal and dispersed power, this center-periphery dynamic will fade and will get more attention to different kinds of identity, different ideas in different parts of the world about what is the proper relationship between culture and politics. The Western mindset tends to think about this in two ways, cultural nationalism or post-national cosmopolitanism, particular ways of thinking about how culture and politics relate to each other. But it's very different in other parts of the world, the Chinese or the Indian or in Africa or whatever. You think about the relationship between culture and politics very differently. So the way our Nordic and Baltic history actually differs from our naive self-understanding of it. What I tried to argue in the first part, that the actual history is very different from the simple understanding of how culture and politics relate. That should actually help us turn openness to non-Western difference. So my general conclusion that might be helpful and might be not, is to warn against seeing cultural proximity as the key to peace. Or to think that general exchange of culture promotes peace. There's no evidence for that either. But particular cultural projects can be part of a politics of identity, of redefining maps, and to, as we saw with the Baltic process. And today, the project, therefore, is to put new identities and delineations in play to make us aware 
of the many complex identities we all live. And in that way, our own experience, if read uh, more critically, is actually helpful for opening us to other parts of the world and to engage in a new kinds of politics of identity, politics of conflict that can help favor cooperation. Thank you.